12. The Hellenistic Period Palestine fell into Alexander's possession in 332, after his death it had an ample share of the troubles arising out of the partition of his inheritance. In 320 it was seized by Ptolemy I, who on a Sabbath day took Jerusalem, but in 315 he had to give way before Antigonus. Even before the Battle of Ipsus, however, he recovered possession once more, and for a century thereafter southern Syria continued to belong to the Egyptian crown, although the Seleucidae more than once sought to wrench it away. In the priestly dynasty during the period of the Ptolemies, Onias I, Ben Jajua was succeeded by his son Simon I, after whom again came first his brothers Eleazar and Manasseh, and next his son Onias II. The last named was in his turn followed by his son Simon II, whose praises are sung by the son of Sirach, 49. 14 16. At the side of the high priest stood the Jerusha of the town of Jerusalem, as a council of state, including the higher ranks of the priesthood. The new sovereign power was at once stronger and juster than the Persian, at least under the earlier Ptolemies, the power of the national government increased, to it was entrusted the business of raising the tribute. As a consequence of the revolutionary changes which had taken place in the conditions of the whole East, the Jewish dispersion, diaspora, began vigorously to spread. It dated its beginning indeed from an earlier period, from the time when the Jews had lost their land and kingdom, but yet, thanks to their religion, could not part with their nationality. They did not by any means all return from Babylon. Perhaps the majority permanently settled abroad. The successors of Alexander, Diadochi fully appreciated this international element, and used it as a link between their barbarian and Hellenic populations. Everywhere they encouraged the settlement of Jews, in Asia Minor, in Syria, and especially in Egypt. Alongside of the Palestinian there arose a Hellenistic Judaism which had its metropolis in Alexandria. Here, under Ptolemy I and II, the Torah had already been translated into Greek, and around this sprung up a Jewish-Greek literature which soon became very extensive. At the court and in the army of the Ptolemies many Jews rose to prominent positions. Everywhere they received the preference over, and everywhere they in consequence earned the hatred of, the indigenous population. After the death of Ptolemy IV. 205, Antiochus III. Attained the object towards which he and his predecessors had long been vainly striving, after a war protracted with varying success through several years, he succeeded at last in incorporating Palestine with the kingdom of the Seleucidae. The Jews took his side, less perhaps because they had become disgusted with the really sadly degenerate Egyptian rule, than because they had foreseen the issue of the contest, and preferred to attach themselves voluntarily to the winning side. In grateful acknowledgement, Antiochus confirmed and enlarged certain privileges of the holy camp, i.e., of Jerusalem, Josephus, Ant, 12. 3, 3. It soon, however, became manifest that the Jews had made but a poor bargain in this exchange. Three years after his defeat at Magnesia, Antiochus III. died, 187, leaving to his son Seleucus IV. An immense burden of debt, which he had incurred by his unprosperous Roman war. Seleucus, in his straits could not afford to be overscrupulous in appropriating money where it was to be found, he did not need to be twice told that the wealth of the temple at Jerusalem was out of all proportion to the expenses of the sacrificial service. The sacred treasure accordingly made the narrowest possible escape from being plundered, Heliodorus, who had been charged by the king to seize it, was deterred at the last moment by a heavenly vision. But the Jews derived no permanent advantage from this. It was a priest of rank, Simon by name, who had called the attention of the king to the temple treasure, his motive had been spite against the high priest Onias III. The son and successor of Simon II. The circumstance is one indication of a melancholy process of disintegration that was at that time going on within the hierocracy. The high priesthood, although there were exceptional cases, such as that of Simon II, was regarded less as a sacred office than as a profitable prince dom within the ranks of the priestly nobility arose envious and jealous factions. Personal advancement was sought by means of the favor of the overlord, who had something to say in the making of appointments. A collateral branch of the ruling family, 
that of the children of Tobias, had by means of the ill-gotten wealth of Joseph ben Tobias attained to a position of ascendancy, and competed in point of power with the high priest himself. It appears that the above-mentioned Simon, and his still more scandalous brother Menelaus, also belonged to the Tobiadi, and, relying upon the support of their powerful party, Josephus, and, 12. 5, 1, cherished the purpose of securing the high priesthood by the aid of the Syrian king. The failure of the mission of Heliodorus was attributed by Simon to a piece of trickery on the part of Onias the high priest. Who accordingly found himself called upon to make his own justification at court and to expose the intrigues of his adversary. Meanwhile Seleucus IV. Died of poison, 175, and Antiochus IV. Epiphanes did not confirm Onias in his dignity, but detained him in Antioch, while he made over the office to his brother Jason, who had offered a higher rent. Possibly the Tobiadi also had something to do with this arrangement, at all events, Menelaus was at the outset the right hand of the new high priest. To secure still further the favor of the king, Jason held himself out to be an enlightened friend of the Greeks, and begged for leave to found in Jerusalem a gymnasium and an ephibium. And to be allowed to sell to the inhabitants there the rights of citizenship in Antioch, a request which was readily granted. The malady which had long been incubating now reached its acute phase. Just in proportion as Hellenism showed itself friendly did it present elements of danger to Judaism. From the periphery it slowly advanced towards the center, from the diaspora to Jerusalem, from mere matters of external fashion to matters of the most profound conviction. 265 especially did the upper and cultivated classes of society begin to feel ashamed, in presence of the refined Greeks, of their Jewish singularity, and to do all in their power to tone it down and conceal it. In this the priestly nobility made itself conspicuous as the most secular section of the community, and it was the high priest who took the initiative in measures which aimed at a complete Hellenizing of the Jews. He outdid everyone else in paganism. Once he sent a considerable present for offerings to the Syrian Hercules on the occasion of his festival. But his messenger, ashamed to apply the money to such a purpose, set it apart for the construction of royal ships of war. The friendship shown by Jason for the Greek king and for all that was Hellenic did not prevent Antiochus for from setting pecuniary considerations before all others. Menelaus, entrusted with the mission of conveying to Antioch the annual Jewish tribute, availed himself of the opportunity to promote his own personal interests by offering a higher sum for the high priesthood. And having otherwise ingratiated himself with the king, gained his object, 171. But though nominated, he did not find it quite easy to obtain possession of the post. The Tobiadi took his side, but the body of the people stuck to Jason, who was compelled to give way only when Syrian troops had been brought upon the scene. Menelaus had immediately, however, to encounter another difficulty, for he could not at once pay the amount of tribute which he had promised. He helped himself so far indeed by robbing the temple, but this landed him in new embarrassments. Onias III, who was living out of employment at Antioch, threatened to make compromising revelations to the king, he was, however, opportunely assassinated. The rage of the people against the priestly temple plunderer now broke out in a rising against a certain Lysimachus, who at the instance of the absent Menelaus had made further inroads upon the sacred treasury. The Jews' defense before the king, at Tyre, on account of this uproar resolved itself into a grievous complaint against the conduct of Menelaus. His case was a bad one, but money again helped him out of his straits, and the extreme penalty of the law fell upon his accusers. The feelings of the Jews with reference to this wolfish shepherd may easily be imagined. Nothing but fear of Antiochus held them in check. Then a report gained currency that the king had perished in an expedition against Egypt, 170. And Jason, who meanwhile had found refuge in Ammonitis, availed himself of the prevailing current of feeling to resume his authority with the help of one thousand men. He was not able, however, to hold the position long, partly because he showed an unwise vindictiveness against his enemies, partly, and chiefly, because the rumor of the death of Antiochus turned out to be false. The king was already, in fact, close at hand on his return from Egypt, 
full of anger at an insurrection which he regarded as having been directed against himself. He inflicted severe and bloody chastisement upon Jerusalem, carried off the treasures of the temple, and restored Menelaus, placing Syrian officials at his side. Jason fled from place to place, and ultimately died in misery at Lacedaemon. The deepest despondency prevailed in Judea, but its cup of sorrow was not yet full. Antiochus, probably soon after his last Egyptian expedition, 168, sent Apollonius with an army against Jerusalem. He fell upon the unsuspecting city, disarmed the inhabitants and demolished the walls, but on the other hand fortified Acre, and garrisoned it strongly, so as to make it a standing menace to the whole country. Having thus made his preparations, he proceeded to carry out his main instructions. All that was religiously distinctive of Judaism was to be removed, such was the will of the king. The Mosaic cultus was abolished, Sabbath observance and the rite of circumcision prohibited, all copies of the Torah confiscated and burnt. In the desecrated and partially destroyed temple pagan ceremonies were performed, and upon the great altar of burnt offering a small altar to Jupiter Capitolinus was erected, on which the first offering was made on 25th Kislev 168. In the country towns also heathen altars were erected, and the Jews compelled, on pain of death, publicly to adore the false gods and to eat swine's flesh that had been sacrificed to idols. The princes and grandees of the Jews had represented to Antiochus that the people were ripe for Hellenization. And inasmuch as, apart from this, to reduce to uniformity the extremely motley constituents of his kingdom was a scheme that lay near his heart, he was very willing to believe them. That the very opposite was the case must of course have become quite evident very soon. But the resistance of the Jews taking the form of rebellious risings against his creatures, he fell upon the hopeless plan of coercion, hopeless, for he could attain his end only by making all Judea one vast graveyard. There existed indeed a pagan party, the Syrian garrison of Acre was partly composed of Jews who sold themselves to be the executioners of their countrymen. Fear also influenced many to deny their convictions. But the majority adhered firmly to the religion of their fathers. Jerusalem, the center of the process of Hellenization, was abandoned by its inhabitants, who made their escape to Egypt, or hid themselves in the country, in deserts and caves. The scribes in especial held fast by the law, and they were joined by the party of the Asadeans, i.e., pious ones. 13. The Hasmoneans. At first there was no thought of meeting violence with violence, as the book of Daniel shows, people consoled themselves with thoughts of the immediate intervention of God which would occur in due time. Quite casually, without either plan or concert, a warlike opposition arose. There was a certain priest Metathias, of the family of the Hasmoneans, a man far advanced in life, whose home was in Modian, a little country town to the west of Jerusalem. Hither also the Syrian soldiers came to put the population to a positive proof of their change of faith, they insisted upon Metathias leading the way. But he was steadfast in his refusal. And, when another Jew addressed himself before his eyes to the work of making the heathen offering, he killed him and the Syrian officer as well, and destroyed the altar. Thereupon he fled to the hill country, accompanied by his sons, Johannes Gaddi, Simon Thassi, Judas Maccabeus, Eliezer Aaron, Jonathan Aphis, and other followers. But he resolved to defend himself to the last, and not to act as some other fugitives had done, who about the same time had allowed themselves to be surrounded and butchered on a Sabbath day without lifting a finger. Thus he became the head of a band which defended the ancestral religion with the sword. They traversed the country, demolished the altars of the false gods, circumcised the children, and persecuted the heathen and heathenishly disposed. The sect of the Asadeans also entrusted itself to their warlike protection, 1 Mac 2. 42. Metathias soon died and left his leadership to Judas Maccabeus, by whom the struggle was carried on in the first instance after the old fashion. Soon, however, it assumed larger dimensions, when regular armies were sent out against the insurgents. First Apollonius, the governor of Judea, took the field, but he was defeated and fell in battle. Next came Saron, governor of Coelisyria, who also was routed near Betharon, 166.
Upon this Lysias, the regent to whom Antiochus IV, who was busied in the Far East, had entrusted the government of Syria and the charge of his son, Antiochus Philopater, a minor, sent a strong force under the command of three generals. Approaching from the west, it was their design to advance separately upon Jerusalem, but Judas anticipated their plan and compelled them to quit the field, 166. The regent now felt himself called on to interpose in person. Invading Judea from the south, he encountered the Jews at Bethsur, who, however, offered an opposition that was not easily overcome. He was prevented from resorting to the last measures by the intelligence which reached him of the death of the king in Elamise, 165. The withdrawal of Lysias secured the fulfillment of the desires of the defenders of the faith in so far as it now enabled them to restore the Jerusalem worship to its previous condition. They lost no time in setting about the accomplishment of this. They were not successful indeed in wresting Acre from the possession of the Syrians, but they so occupied the garrison as to prevent it from interfering with the work of restoration. On 25 Kislev 165, the very day on which, three years before, the abomination of desolation had been inaugurated, the first sacrifice was offered on the new altar. And in commemoration of this the feast of the dedication was thenceforth celebrated. As it was easy to see that danger still impended, the temple was put into a state of defense, as also was the town of Bethsur, where Lysias had been checked. But the favorable moment presented by the change of sovereign was made use of for still bolder attempts. Scattered over the whole of southern Syria there were a number of Jewish localities on which the heathens now proceeded to wreak their vengeance. For the purpose of rescuing these oppressed co-religionists, and of bringing them in safety to Judea, the Maccabees made a series of excursions, extending in some cases as far as to Lebanon and Damascus. Lysias had his hands otherwise fully occupied, and perhaps did not feel much disposed to continue the fight on behalf of the cultus of Jupiter Capitolinus. Daily gaining in boldness, the Jews now took in hand also to lay regular siege to Acre. Then at last Lysias yielded to the pressure of Syrian and Jewish deputations and determined to take serious steps, 162. With a large force he entered Judea, again from the south, and laid siege to Bethsur. Judas vainly attempted the relief of the fortress, he sustained near Bethsicaria a defeat in which his brother Eleazar perished. Bethsur was unable to hold out, being short of provisions on account of the sabbatic year. The Syrians advanced next to Jerusalem and besieged the temple, it also was insufficiently provisioned, and would soon have been compelled to surrender, had not Lysias been again called away at the critical moment by other exigencies. A certain Philip was endeavouring to oust him from the regency. As it was necessary for him to have his hands free in dealing with this new enemy, he closed a treaty with the temple garrison and the people at large. In accordance with which at once the political subjection and the religious freedom of the Jews were to be maintained. Thus the situation as it had existed before Antiochus IV was restored. Only no attempt was made to replace Menelaus as high priest and ethnarch, this post was to be filled by Alcimus. The concessions thus made by Lysias were inevitable. And even King Demetrius I, son of Seleucus IV, who towards the end of 162 ascended the throne and caused both Lysias and his ward to be put to death, had no thought of interfering with their religious freedom. But the Maccabees desired something more than the status quo ante, after having done their duty they were disinclined to retire in favor of Alcimus, whose sole claim lay in his descent from the old heathenishly disposed high priestly family. Alcimus was compelled to invoke the assistance of the king, who caused him to be installed by Bacchides. He was at once recognized by the scribes and Asadians, for whom, with religious liberty, everything they wished had been secured. The claims to supremacy made by the Hasmoneans were of no consequence to them. Doubtless the masses also would ultimately have quietly accepted Alcimus, who of course refrained from interference with either law or worship. Had he not abused the momentary power he derived from the presence of Bacchides to take a foolish revenge. But the consequence of his action was that, as soon as Bacchides had turned his back, Alcimus was compelled to follow him. For the purpose of restoring him a Syrian army once more invaded Judea under Nicanor, 160, 
but first at Kafr Salama and afterwards at Betharon was defeated by Judas, and almost annihilated in the subsequent flight. Nicanor himself being among the slain, 13th Adar equals Nicanor's day. Judas was now at the acme of his prosperity, about this time he concluded his, profitless, treaty with the Romans. But disaster was impending. In the month of Nisan, barely a month after the defeat of Nicanor, a new Syrian army under Bakchides entered Judea from the north. Near Elasa, southward from Jerusalem, a decisive battle was fought which was lost by Judas, and in which he himself fell. The religious war properly so called had already been brought once for all to an end by the convention of Lysias. If the struggle continued to be carried on, it was not for the faith but for the supremacy, less in the interests of the community than in those of the Hasmoneans. After the death of Judas the secular character which the conflict had assumed ever since 162 continually became more conspicuous. Jonathan Aphis fought for his house, and in doing so used thoroughly worldly means. The high priesthood, i.e. the ethnarchy, was the goal of his ambition. So long as Alcimus lived, it was far from his reach. Confined to the rocky fastnesses beside the Dead Sea, he had nothing for it but, surrounded by his faithful followers, to wait for better times. But on the death of Alcimus, 159, the Syrians refrained from appointing a successor, to obviate the necessity of always having to protect him with military force. During the interregnum of seven years which followed, Jonathan again came more and more to the front, so that at last Bakchides concluded an armistice with him on the basis of the status quo, 1 Mac, 9. 13. From his residence at Michmash Jonathan now exercised a de facto authority over the entire nation. When accordingly Alexander Ballas, a reputed son of Antiochus IV, rose against Demetrius, both rivals exerted themselves to secure the alliance of Jonathan, who did not fail to benefit by their competition. First of all, Demetrius formally recognized him as Prince of Judah. In consequence of this he removed to Jerusalem, and expelled the heathen and heathenishly disposed, who continued to maintain a footing only in Acre and Bethsur. Next Alexander Ballas conferred on him the title of High Priest of the Nation and Friend of the King, in gratitude for which Jonathan went over to his side, 152. He remained loyal, although Demetrius now made larger offers. He was justified by the event, for Demetrius I, had the worst of it and was slain, 150. The victorious Ballas heaped honors upon Jonathan, who maintained his fidelity, and fought successfully in his interests when in 147 Demetrius II. The son of Demetrius I, challenged a conflict. The high priest was unable indeed to prevent the downfall of Alexander in 145, but Demetrius II, won by presence, far from showing any hostility, confirmed him in his position in consideration of a tribute of 300 talents. Jonathan was grateful to the king, as he showed by going with 3,000 men to his aid against the insurgent Antiochenes. But when the latter drew back from his promise to withdraw the garrison from Acre, he went over to the side of Trypho, who had set up a son of Alexander Ballas, Antiochus, as a rival. In the war which he now waged as Seleucid Strategus against Demetrius he succeeded in subduing almost the whole of Palestine. Meanwhile his brother Simon remained behind in Judea, mastered the fortress of Bethsur, and resumed with great energy the siege of Acre. All this was done in the names of Antiochus and Trypho, but really of course in the interests of the Jews themselves. There were concluded also treaties with the Romans and Lacedaemonians, certainly not to the advantage of the Syrians. Trypho sought now to get rid of the man whom he himself had made so powerful. He treacherously seized and imprisoned Jonathan in Ptolemy, and meditated an attack upon the leaderless country. But on the frontier Simon, the last remaining son of Metathius, met him in force. All Trypho's efforts to break through proved futile. After skirting all Judea from west to south, without being able to get clear of Simon, he at last withdrew to Perea without having accomplished anything. On the person of Jonathan, whom he caused to be executed, he vented the spleen he felt on the discovery that the cause for which that prince had fought was able to gain the victory even when deprived of his help. Simon, in point of fact, 
was Jonathan's equal as a soldier and his superior as a ruler. He secured his frontier by means of fortresses, made himself master of Acre, 141, and understood how to enable the people in time of peace to reap the advantages that result from successful war. Agriculture, industry, and commerce, from the haven of Joppa, began to flourish vigorously. In grateful recognition of his services the high priesthood and the ethnarchy were bestowed upon him as hereditary possessions by a solemn assembly of the people, until a trustworthy prophet should arise. Nominally the Seleucidae still continued to possess the suzerainty. Simon naturally had detached himself from Trypho and turned to Demetrius too. Who confirmed him in his position, remitted all arrears of tribute, and waived his rights for the future, 142. The friendship of Demetrius II. And of his successor Antiochus Sidetes with Simon, however, lasted only as long as Trypho still remained in the way. But, he once removed, Sidetes altered his policy. He demanded of Simon the surrender of Joppa, Gazara, and other towns, besides the citadel of Jerusalem, as well as payment of all tribute resting due. The refusal of these demands led to war, which in its earlier stages was carried on with success, but the scales were turned after the murder of Simon, when Saites in person took the field against John Hyrcanus, Simon's son and successor. Jerusalem capitulated, in the negotiations for peace the surrender of all the external possessions of the Jews was insisted upon, the suzerainty of the Syrians became once more a reality, 135. But in 130 the powerful Antiochus Saites fell in an expedition against the Parthians. And the complications anew arising in reference to the succession to the Syrian throne placed Hyrcanus in a position to recover what he had lost and to make new acquisitions. He subjugated Samaria and Idumea, compelling the inhabitants of the latter to accept circumcision. Like his predecessors, he too sought to secure the favor of the Romans, but derived no greater benefit from the effort than they had done. After a prosperous reign of thirty years he died in 105. By Josephus he is represented as a pattern of all that a pious prince ought to be, by the rabbins as representing a splendid high priesthood. The darkness of the succeeding age lent a brighter color to his image. The external splendor of the Hasmonean kingdom did not at once die away, the downfall of the Seleucidae, which was its negative condition, being also a slow affair. Judah Aristobulus, the son of Hyrcanus, who reigned for only one year, was the first to assume the Greek title of royalty, Icheria was subdued by him, and circumcision forced upon the inhabitants. His brother Jonathan, Janius, Alexander, 104-79, in a series of continual wars, which were never very prosperous, nevertheless succeeded in adding the whole coast of Philistia, Gaza, as well as a great portion of Perea to his hereditary dominions. 266 But the external enlargement of the structure was secured at the cost of its internal consistency. From the time when Jonathan, the son of Metathias, began to carry on the struggle no longer for the cause of God but for his own interests, the scribes, and the Assadeans, as we have seen, had withdrawn themselves from the party of the Maccabees there can be no doubt that from their legal standpoint they were perfectly right in contenting themselves, as they did, with the attainment of religious liberty, and in accepting Alcimus. The Hasmoneans had no hereditary right to the high priesthood, and their politics, which aimed at the establishment of a national monarchy, were contrary to the whole spirit and essence of the second theocracy. The presupposition of that theocracy was foreign domination, in no other way could its sacred, i.e., clerical, character be maintained. God and the law could not but be forced into the background if a warlike kingdom, retaining indeed the forms of a hierocracy, but really violating its spirit at every point, should ever grow out of a mere pious community. Above all, how could the scribes hope to retain their importance if temple and synagogue were cast into the shade by politics and clash of arms? But under the first great Hasmoneans the zealots for the law were unable to force their way to the front, the enthusiasm of the people was too strong for them. They had nothing for it but to keep themselves out of the current and refuse to be swept along by it. Even under Hyrcanus, however, they gained more prominence, and under Janius their influence upon popular opinion was paramount.
For under the last name the secularization of the hierocracy no longer presented any attractive aspects, it was wholly repellent. It was looked upon as a revolting anomaly that the king, who was usually in the field with his army, should once and again assume the sacred mantle in order to perform the sacrifice on some high festival, and that his officers, profane persons as they were, should at the same time be holders of the highest spiritual offices. The danger which in all this threatened, the idea of Judaism, could not in these circumstances escape the observation of even the common people, for this idea was God and the law, not any earthly fatherland. The masses accordingly ranged themselves with ever-growing unanimity on the side of the Pharisees, i.e., the party of the scribes, as against the Sadducees, i.e., the Hasmonean party. 267. On one occasion, when Alexander Janius had returned to Jerusalem at the Feast of Tabernacles, and was standing in his priestly vestments before the altar to sacrifice. He was pelted by the assembled crowd of worshippers with citrons from the green branches they carried. By the cruelty with which he punished this insult he excited the populace to the highest pitch, and, when he lost his army in the disaster of Gadara, rebellion broke out. The Pharisees summoned the Syrian king Demetrius Eucurus. Janius was worsted and fled into the desert. But as he wandered in helplessness there, the patriotism of the people and sympathy for the heir of the Maccabees suddenly awoke. Nature proved itself stronger than that consistency which in the cause of the divine honor had not shrunk from treason. The insurgents for the most part went over to the side of the fugitive king. The others he ultimately overpowered after a struggle which lasted through several years, Demetrius having withdrawn his intervention. The vengeance which he took on the Pharisees was a bloody one, their only escape was by voluntary exile. Thenceforward he had peace so far as they were concerned. His last years were occupied with the reacquisition of the conquests which he had been compelled to yield to the Arabs during the civil war. He died in the field at the siege of Ragaba in Perea, 79. Under Queen Salome, his widow, matters were as if they had been specially arranged for the satisfaction of the Pharisees. The high priesthood passed to Salome's son, Hyrcanus II. She herself was only queen. In the management of external affairs her authority was absolute, and, 13. 16, 6, in home policy she permitted the scribes to wield a paramount influence. The common assertion, indeed, that the Sinedrium was at that time practically composed of scribes, is inconsistent with the known facts of the case, the Sinedrium at that time was a political and not a scholastic authority. 268 In its origin it was the Municipal Council of Jerusalem, so also the councils of provincial towns are called Sinedria, Mark 13. 9. But its authority extended over the entire Jewish community. Alongside of the elders of the city the ruling priests were those who had the greatest number of seats and votes. John Hyrcanus appears to have been the first to introduce some scribes into its composition. It is possible that Salome may have increased their number, but even so this high court was far from being changed into a college of scribes like that at Jamnia. If the domination of the Pharisees at this time is spoken of, the expression cannot be understood as meaning that they already held all the public offices. But only at most that the holders of those offices found it necessary to administer and to judge in their spirit and according to their fundamental principles. The party of the Sadducees, consisting of the old Hasmonean officers and officials, who were of priestly family indeed, but attached only slight importance to their priestly functions, at length lost all patience. Led by Aristobulus, the second son of Janius, the leaders of the party came to the palace, and begged the queen to dismiss them from the court and to send them into the provinces. There they were successful in securing possession of several fortresses 269 in preparation for insurrection, a favorable opportunity for which they were watching. Such an opportunity occurred, it seemed to Aristobulus, as his mother lay on her deathbed. The commandants of the fortresses were at his orders, and by their assistance an army also, with which he accordingly advanced upon Jerusalem, and, on the death of Salome, made himself master of the situation. 69. Hyrcanus was compelled to resign office. With this event the good understanding between the civil government and the Pharisees came to an end. The old antagonisms became active once more, 
and now began to operate for the advantage of a third party, the Idumean Antipater, Hyrcanus's confidential friend. After the latter, aided by Antipater, had at length with great difficulty got himself into a position for asserting his rights against Aristobulus, the Pharisees could not do otherwise than rank themselves upon his side. And the masses joined them against the usurper. With the help of the Nabataean monarch the effort to restore the elder brother to the supreme authority would doubtless have succeeded had not the Romans procured relief for Aristobulus, besieged as he was in Jerusalem, 65. Though without thereby recognizing his claims. Pompey continued to delay a decision on the controversy in 64 also when the rival claimants presented themselves before him at Damascus, he wished first to have the Nabataeans disposed of, and to have free access to them through Judea. This hesitation roused the suspicions of Aristobulus, still he did not venture to take decisive action upon them. He closed the passes, to Mount Ephraim, against the Romans, but afterwards gave them up. He prepared Jerusalem for war, and then went in person to the Roman camp at Jericho, where he promised to open the gates of the city and also to pay a sum of money. But the Roman ambassadors found the gates barred, and had to return empty-handed. Aristobulus thereupon was arrested, and siege was laid to Jerusalem. The party of Hyrcanus, as soon as it had gained the upper hand, surrendered the town, but the supporters of Aristobulus took their stand in the temple, and defended it obstinately. In June 63 the place was carried by storm, Pompey personally inspected the Holy of Holies, but otherwise spared the religious feelings of the Jews. But he caused the chief promoters of the war to be executed, and carried Aristobulus and his family into captivity. He abolished the kingship, but restored the high priestly dignity to Hyrcanus. The territory was materially reduced in area, and made tributary to the Romans, the city was occupied by a Roman garrison. 14. Herod and the Romans. Henceforward Roman intervention forms a constant disturbing factor in Jewish history. The struggle between the Pharisees and the Sadducees continued indeed to be carried on, but only because the momentum of their old feud was not yet exhausted. The Pharisees in a sense had been victorious. While the two brothers were pleading their rival claims before Pompey, ambassadors from the Pharisees had made their appearance in Damascus to petition for the abolition of the kingship, this object had now to some extent been gained. Less ambiguous than the victory of the Pharisees was the fall of the Sadducees, who in losing the sovereignty of the Jewish state lost all real importance. But the intervention of the foreign element exercised its most powerful influence upon the temper of the lower classes. Though in times of peace the masses still continued to accept the guidance of the rabbins, their patriotism instantly burst into flame as soon as a pretender to the throne, belonging to the family of Aristobulus, appeared in Palestine. During the decennia which immediately followed, Jewish history was practically absorbed in vain attempts to restore the old Hasmonean kingdom. Insurrections of steadily increasing dimensions were made in favor of Aristobulus, the representative of the national cause. For Hyrcanus was not regarded as a Hasmonean at all, but merely as the creature of Antipater and the Romans. First, in the year 57, Alexander the son of Aristobulus broke into rebellion, then in 56 Aristobulus himself and his son Antigonus, and in 55 Alexander again. Antipater was never able to hold his own, Roman intervention was in every case necessary. The division of the Hasmonean state into five aristocracies, by Gabinius had no effect in diminishing the feeling of national unity cherished by the Jews of Palestine. Once again, after the Battle of Cary, a rising took place, which Cassius speedily repressed. In 49 the Great Roman Civil War broke out. Caesar instigated Aristobulus against Antipater, who in common with the whole East had espoused the cause of Pompey. But Aristobulus was poisoned by the opposite party while yet in Italy, and about the same time his son Alexander was also put to death at Antioch, thus the danger to Antipater passed away. After the Battle of Pharsalus he went over to Caesar's side, and soon after rendered him an important service by helping him out of his difficulties at Alexandria. By this means he earned the goodwill of Caesar towards the whole body of the Jews and secured for himself, or Hyrcanus, a great extension of power and of territory. The five, Sinedria, or aristocracies, 
of Gabinius were superseded, the most important conquest of the Hasmoneans restored, the walls of Jerusalem, which Pompey had raised, rebuilt. However indisputable the advantages conferred by the rule of Antipater, the Jews could not forget that the Idumean, in name of Hyrcanus, the rightful heir of the Hasmoneans, was in truth setting up an authority of his own. The Sadducean aristocracy in particular, which formerly in the Sanhedrin had shared the supreme power with the high priest, endeavored to restore reality once more to the nominal ascendancy which still continued to be attributed to the ethnarch and the Sanhedrin. When the authorities, Omicron knew Talamda Epsilon Iota, of the Jews saw how the power of Antipater and his sons was growing, their disposition towards him became hostile, Josephus, Ant, 14. 9, 3. They were specially jealous of the youthful Herod, to whom Galilee had been entrusted by his father. On account of the arbitrary execution of a robber chief Ezekias, who perhaps had originally been a Hasmonean partisan, they summoned him before the Sanhedrin. Under the impression that it was not yet too late to remind him that he was after all but a servant. But the defiant demeanor of the culprit, and a threatening missive which at the same time arrived from Sextus Caesar demanding his acquittal, rendered his judges speechless. Nor did they regain their courage until they had heard the stinging reproaches of Samias the scribe. Yet the aged Hyrcanus, who did not comprehend the danger that was threatening himself, postponed judgment upon Herod, and gave him opportunity to withdraw. Having been appointed strategus of Coela Syria by Sextus Caesar in the meanwhile he soon afterwards appeared before Jerusalem at the head of an army. And the authorities were compelled to address themselves in a conciliatory manner to his father and to Phaziel his brother in order to secure his withdrawal. The attempt to crush the serpent which had thus effected a lodgment in the Hasmonean house came too late. The result of it simply was that the Herodians had now the advantage of being able to distinguish between Hyrcanus and his evil counselors. From that moment the downfall of the Sadducean notables was certain. It was of no avail to them that after the Battle of Philippi, 42, they accused Herod and Phaziel, Antipater having been murdered in 43, before Antony of having been helpful in every possible way to Cassius. Antony declared himself in the most decisive manner for the two brothers. In their despair, for properly speaking they were not national fanatics but only egoistic politicians, they ultimately made common cause with Antigonus the son of Aristobulus, and threw themselves into the arms of the Parthians. Perceiving the interests of the Romans and of Herod to be inseparable, 40. Fortune at first seemed to have declared in favor of the pretender. The masses unanimously took his side, Phaziel committed suicide in prison, with a single blow Herod was stripped of all his following and made a helpless fugitive. He took refuge in Rome, however, where he was named King of Judea by the Senate, and after a somewhat protracted war he finally, with the help of the legions of Sosius, made himself master of Jerusalem. 37. The captive Antigonus was beheaded at Antioch. King Herod began his reign by reorganizing the Sanhedrin, he ordered the execution of forty-five of its noblest members, his most zealous opponents. These were the Sadducean notables who long had headed the struggle against the Idumean interlopers. Having thus made away with the leaders of the Jerusalem aristocracy, he directed his efforts to the business of corrupting the rest. He appointed to the most important posts obscure individuals, of priestly descent, from Babylon and Alexandria, and thus replaced with creatures of his own the old aristocracy. Nor did he rest content with this. In order to preclude the possibility of any independent authority ever arising alongside of his own, he abolished the life tenure of the high priestly office, and brought it completely under the control of the secular power. By this means he succeeded in relegating the Sadducees to utter insignificance. They were driven out of their native sphere, the political, into the region of theoretical and ecclesiastical discussion, where they continued, but on quite unequal terms, their old dispute with the Pharisees. It was during the period of Herod's activity that the Pharisees, strictly speaking, enjoyed their greatest prosperity, Samias and Eptalion, Hillel and Shammai, in the Sanhedrin they became so numerous as almost to equal the priests and elders. Quite consistently with their principles they had abstained from taking any part in the life and death struggle for the existence of the national state.
Their leaders had even counseled the fanatical defenders of Jerusalem to open the gates to the enemy, for this service they were treated with the highest honor by Herod. He made it part of his general policy to favor the Pharisees, as also the sect of the Essenes, insignificant though it was. It being his purpose to restrict the national life again within those purely ecclesiastical channels of activity which it had abandoned since the Maccabean Wars. However reckless his conduct in other respects, he was always scrupulously careful to avoid wounding religious susceptibilities, and, 14. 16, 3. But although the Pharisees might be quite pleased that the high priesthood and the kingship were no longer united in one and the same person, and that interest in the law again overshadowed interest in politics. The populace for their part could never forgive Herod for overthrowing the old dynasty. That he himself, at least in religious profession, was a Jew did not improve his position, but rather made it worse. It was not easy for him to stifle the national feeling after it had once been revived among the Jews. They could not forget the recent past, and objected to being thrust back into the time when foreign domination was endured by them as a matter of course. The Romans were regarded in quite a different light from that in which the Persians and the Greeks had been viewed, and Herod was only the client of the Romans. His greatest danger seemed to arise from the still surviving members of the Hasmonean family, to whom, as is easily understood, the national hopes clung. In the course of the earlier years of his reign he removed every one of them from his path, beginning with his youthful brother-in-law Aristobulus, 35, after whom came his old patron Hyrcanus II. 30, then Miriam his wife, 29, and finally his stepmother Alexandra, 28, the daughter of Hyrcanus and the widow of Alexander Aristobuli. Subsequently, in 25, he caused Costabaris and the sons of Babas to be executed. While thus occupied with domestic affairs, Herod had constant trouble also in his external relations, and each new phase in his political position immediately made itself felt at home. In the first instance he had much to suffer from Cleopatra, who would willingly have seen Palestine reduced under Egyptian domination once more, and who actually succeeded in inducing Antony to take from Herod several fair and valuable provinces of his realm. Next, his whole position was imperiled by the result of the Battle of Actium, he had once more ranged himself upon the wrong side. But his tact did not fail him in winning Octavianus, as before it had made Antony his friend. In fact he reaped nothing but advantage from the great overturn which took place in Roman affairs, it rid him of Cleopatra, a dangerous enemy, and gave him in the new imperator a much better master than before. During the following years he had leisure to carry out those splendid works of peace by which it was his aim to ingratiate himself with the emperor. He founded cities and harbors, Antipatris, Caesarea, constructed roads, theaters, and temples, and subsidized far beyond his frontier all works of public utility. He taxed the Jews heavily, but in compensation promoted their material interests with energy and discretion, and built for them, from 20 or 19 BC onwards, the temple at Jerusalem. To gain their sympathies he well knew to be impossible. Apart from the Roman legions at his back his authority had its main support in his fortresses and in his system of espionage. But just as the acme of his splendor had been reached, he himself became the instrument of a terrible vengeance for the crimes by which his previous years had been stained. As executioner of all the Hasmoneans, he was now constrained to be the executioner of his own children also. His suspicious temper had been aroused against his now grown-up sons by Miriam, whose claims through their mother to the throne were superior to his own. His brother Pheroras and his sister Salome made it their special business to fan his jealousy into flame. To show the two somewhat arrogant youths that the succession was not so absolutely secure in their favor as they were supposing, the father summoned to his court Antipater, the exiled son of a former marriage. Antipater, under the mask of friendship, immediately began to carry on infamous intrigues against his half-brothers, in which Pheroras and Salome unconsciously played into his hands. For years he persevered alike in favoring and unfavoring circumstances with his part, until at last, by the machinations of a Lacedaemonian, Eurycles, who had been bribed, Herod was induced to condemn the sons of Mariam at Berytus. And caused them to be strangled, Samaria, 7-6b. c. 
Not long afterwards a difference between Antipater and Salome led to the exposure of the former. Herod was compelled to drain the cup to the dregs, he was not spared the knowledge that he had murdered his children without a cause. His remorse threw him into a serious illness. In which his strong constitution wrestled long with death. While he lay at Jericho near his end he gave orders for the execution of Antipater also, and to embitter the joy of the Jews at his removal he caused their elders to be shut up together in the Hippodrome at Jericho with the injunction to butcher them as soon as he breathed his last. That so there might be sorrow throughout the land. The latter order, however, was not carried out. His death, for B.C., gave the signal for an insurrection of small beginnings which gradually spread until it ultimately infected all the people, it was repressed by Varus with great cruelty. Meanwhile Herod's connections were at Rome disputing about the inheritance. The deceased king, who was survived by several children of various marriages, had made a will, which was substantially confirmed by Augustus. By it his son Philip received the northern portion of the territory on the east of the Jordan along with the district of Panias, Caesarea Philippi, his thirty-seven years reign over this region was happy. Another son, Herod Antipas, obtained Galilee and Perea, he beautified his domains with architectural works, Siphorus, Tiberius, Livias, Machiris, and succeeded by his fox-like policy in ingratiating himself with the emperors, particularly with Tiberius, for that very cause, however, becoming odious to the Roman provincial officials. The principal heir was Archelaus, to whom Idumia, Dudea, and Samaritus were allotted, Augustus at first refused him the title of king. Archelaus had experienced the greatest difficulty in carrying through his claims before the emperor in face of the manifold oppositions of his enemies, the vengeance which he wreaked upon his subjects was so severe that in 6 AD, a Jewish and Samaritan embassy besought the emperor for his deposition. Augustus assented, banishing Archelaus to Vienne, and putting in his place a Roman procurator. Thenceforward Dudea continued under procurators, with the exception of a brief interval, 41-44 AD, during which Herod Agrippa I united under his sway all the dominions of his grandfather. 270. The termination of the vassal kingship resulted in manifest advantage to the Sadducees. The high priest and Sinedrium again acquired political importance. They were the responsible representatives of the nation in presence of the suzerain power, and conceived themselves to be in some sort lords of land and people, John 11. 48. For the Pharisees the new state of affairs appears to have been less satisfactory. That the Romans were much less oppressive to the Jews than the rulers of the house of Herod was a consideration of less importance to them than the fact that the heathen first unintentionally and then deliberately were guilty of the rudest outrages upon the law. Outrages against which those sly half-Jews had well understood how to be on their guard. It was among the lower ranks of the people, however, that hatred to the Romans had its proper seat. On the basis of the views and tendencies which had long prevailed there, a new party was now formed, that of the Zealots, which did not, like the Pharisees, aim merely at the fulfillment of all righteousness, i.e. of the law, and leave everything else in the hands of God, but was determined to take an active part in bringing about the realization of the kingdom of God, Josephus, and, 18. 1, 1. As the transition to the new order of things was going on, the census of Quirinius took place, 6-7 AD. It occasioned an immense excitement, which, however, was successfully allayed. On the withdrawal of Quirinius, Caponius remained behind as procurator of Judea, he was followed, under Augustus, by Marcus Ambivius and Annius Rufus, under Tiberius. By Valerius Gratus, 15-26 AD, and Pontius Pilatus, 26 to 36 AD, under Caligula, by Marcellus, 36 to 37, and Marillus, 37 to 41 AD. The procurators were subordinate to the imperial legati of Syria, they resided in Caesarea, and visited Jerusalem on special occasions only. They had command of the military, and their chief business was the maintenance of the peace and the care of the revenue. They interested themselves in affairs of religion only in so far as these had a political side, the temple citadel Antonia was constantly garrisoned with a cohort.
the administration of justice appears to have been left to a very considerable extent in the hands of the Sinedrium. But it was not allowed to give effect to any capital sentence. At the head of the native authorities stood at this time not so much the actual high priest as the college of the chief priests. The actual office of high priest had lost its political importance in consequence of the frequency with which its holders were changed, thus. For example, Anas had more influence than Caiaphas. The principle of interfering as little as possible with the religious liberty of the Jews was rudely assailed by the Emperor Caius, who like a second Antiochus, after various minor vexations, gave orders that his image should be set up in the Temple of Jerusalem as in others elsewhere. It was entirely through the courage and tact of the Syrian governor P. Petronius that the execution of these orders was temporarily postponed until the emperor was induced by Agrippa I. to withdraw them. Caius soon afterwards died, and under the rule of Agrippa I., to whom the government of the entire kingdom of his grandfather was committed by Claudius, the Jews enjoyed much prosperity, in every respect the king was all they could wish. This very prosperity seems, however, to have caused them fresh danger. For it made them feel the government by procurators, which was resumed after the death of Agrippa I. To be particularly hard to bear, whatever the individual characters of these might be. They were Cuspius Fadus, from 44, under whom Theudas, Tiberius Alexander, the Romanist nephew of Philo, till 48, Cuminus, 48 to 52, under whom the volcano already began to give dangerous signs of activity, and Felix, 52 to 60. Felix, who has the honor to be pilloried in the pages of Tacitus, contrived to make the dispeace permanent. The influence of the two older parties, both of which were equally interested in the maintenance of the existing order, and in that interest were being drawn nearer to each other, diminished day by day. The masses broke loose completely from the authority of the scribes, the ruling nobility adapted itself better to the times. Under the circumstances which then prevailed, it is not surprising that they became thoroughly secular and did not shrink from the employment of directly immoral means for the attainment of their ends. The zealots became the dominant party. It was a combination of noble and base elements, superstitious enthusiasts, Acts 21. 38, and political assassins, the so-called Sicarii, were conjoined with honest but fanatical patriots. Felix favored the Sicarii in order that he might utilize them, against the others his hostility raged with indiscriminating cruelty, yet without being able to check them. The anarchy which he left behind him as a legacy was beyond the control of his able successor Porcius Festus, 60-62, and the last two procurators, Albinus, 62-64, and Jesius Florus. Acted as if it had been their special business to encourage and promote it. All the bonds of social order were dissolved, no property was secure, the assassins alone prospered, and the procurators went shares with them in the profits. It was inevitable that deep resentment against the Romans should be felt in every honest heart. At last it found expression. During his visit to Jerusalem in May 66 Florus laid hands upon the temple treasure. The Jews allowed themselves to go so far as to make a joke about it, which he avenged by giving over a portion of the city to be plundered, and crucifying a number of the inhabitants. He next insisted upon their kissing the rod, ordering that a body of troops which was approaching should be met and welcomed. At the persuasion of their leaders the Jews forced themselves even to this. But a constant succession of fresh insults and cruelties followed, till patience was quite exhausted at last, and in a violent street fight the Romans were so handled that the procurator withdrew from the town, leaving only the cohort in Antonia. Once again was an attempt at pacification made by Agrippa too, who hastened from Alexandria with this purpose, but the Jews could not bring themselves to make submission to Jesius Florus. It so happened that at this juncture the fortress of Masada on the Dead Sea fell into the hands of the zealots. The courage of the party of action rose, and at the instance of the hot-headed Eleazar the son of Ananias, a man, still young, of highest priestly family, the sacrifice on behalf of the emperor was discontinued, i.e., revolt was declared but the native authorities continued opposed to a war. At their request King Agrippa sent soldiers to Jerusalem, at first they appeared to have some effect, but ultimately they were glad to make their escape in safety from the city.
the cohort in Antonia was in like manner unable to hold its own, freedom was given it to withdraw, but, contrary to the terms of capitulation, it was put to the sword. The war party now signalized its triumph over all elements of opposition from within by the murder of the high priest Ananias. A triumph was gained also over the outer foe. The Syrian legate, Cestius Gallus, appeared before Jerusalem in the autumn of 66, but after a short period raised the siege, his deliberate withdrawal was changed into a precipitate flight in an attack made by the Jews at Betharon. The revolt now spread irresistibly through all ranks and classes of the population, and the aristocracy found it expedient itself to assume the leadership. An autonomous government was organized, with the noblest members of the community at its head, of these the most important was the high priest Ananus. Meanwhile Nero entrusted the conduct of the Jewish war to Vespasian, his best general. In the spring of 67 he began his task in Galilee, where the historian Josephus had command of the insurgents. The Jews entirely distrusted him and he them. In a short time the Romans were masters of Galilee, only a few strong places holding out against them. Josephus was besieged in Jotapata, and taken prisoner, the other places also were unable to hold out long. Such of the champions of freedom in Galilee as escaped betook themselves to Jerusalem, amongst these was the zealot leader John of Giscala. There they told the story of their misfortunes, of which they laid the blame upon Josephus, and upon the aristocratic government as having no heart for the common cause and having treachery for their motto. The zealots now openly aimed at the overthrow of the existing government, but Ananus bravely withstood them, and pressed so hard on them that they summoned the Idumeans into the city to their aid. These honorable fanatics indeed withdrew again as soon as they had discovered that they were being used for sinister designs, but in the meanwhile they had accomplished the work of the zealots. The old magistracy of Jerusalem was destroyed, Ananus with the heads of the aristocracy and very many other respectable citizens put to death. The radicals, for the most part not natives of the city, came into power. John of Giscala at their head tyrannized over the inhabitants. While these events were taking place in Jerusalem, Vespasian had subdued the whole country, with the exception of one or two fortresses. But as he was setting about the siege of the capital, tidings arrived of the death of Nero, and the offensive was discontinued. For almost two years, June 68 to April 70, with a short break, war was suspended. When Vespasian at the end of this period became emperor, he entrusted to Titus the task of reducing Jerusalem. There in the interval the internal struggle had been going on, even after the radicals had gained the mastery. As a counterpoise to John of Giscala the citizens had received the guerrilla captain Simon Bar Giora into the city, the two were now at feud with each other, but were alike in their rapacity towards the citizens. John occupied the temple, Simon the upper city lying over against it on the west. For a short time a third entered into competition with the two rivals, a certain Eliezer who had separated from John and established himself in the inner temple. But just as Titus was beginning the siege, Easter, 70, John contrived to get rid of this interloper. Titus attacked from the north. After the lower city had fallen into his hands, he raised banks with a view to the storm of the temple and the upper city. But the defenders, who were now united in a common cause, taught him by their vigorous resistance that his object was not to be so quickly gained. He therefore determined to reduce them by famine, and for this end completely surrounded the city with a strong wall. In the beginning of July he renewed the attack, which he directed in the first instance against the temple. The tower of Antonia fell on the fifth, but the temple continued to be held notwithstanding, until the seventeenth the daily sacrifice continued to be offered. The Romans succeeded in gaining the outer court in August only. To drive them out, the Jews in the night of August 10th to 11th made a sortie, but were compelled to retire, the enemy forcing their way behind them into the inner court. A legionary flung a firebrand into an annex of the temple, and soon the whole structure was in flames. A terrible slaughter of the defenders ensued, but John with a determined band succeeded in cutting his way out, and by means of the bridge over the Tyropean Valley made his escape into the upper city. No attack had as yet been directed against this quarter, but famine was working terrible ravages among the crowded population. 
Those in command, however, refused to capitulate unless freedom to withdraw along with their wives and children were granted. These terms being withheld, a storm, after the usual preparations on the part of the Romans, took place. The resistance was feeble, the strong towers were hardly defended at all, Simon bar Giora and John of Giscola now thought only of their personal safety. In the unprotected city the Roman soldiers spread fire and slaughter unchecked, September 7, 70. Of those who survived also some were put to death, the rest were sold or carried off to the mines and amphitheaters. The city was leveled with the ground, the 10th legion was left behind in charge. Titus took with him to Rome for his triumphal procession Simon bar Giora and John of Giscola, along with 700 other prisoners, also the sacred booty taken from the temple, the candlestick, the golden table, and a copy of the Torah. He was slightly premature with his triumph, for some time elapsed, and more than one bloody battle was necessary before the rebellion was completely stifled. It did not come wholly to an end until the fall of Masada, April 73. 15. The Rabbins. Even now Palestine continued for a while to be the center of Jewish life, but only in order to prepare the way for its transition into thoroughly cosmopolitan forms. The development of thought sustained no break on account of the sad events which had taken place, but was only directed once more in a consistent manner towards these objects which had been set before it from the time of the Babylonian exile. On the ruins of the city and of the temple the Pharisaic Judaism which rests upon the law and the school celebrated its triumph. National fanaticism indeed was not yet extinguished, but it burnt itself completely out in the vigorous insurrection led by Simeon bar Koziba, bar Kochibas, 132-135. That a conspicuous rabbin, Akiba, should have taken part in it, and have recognized in Simeon the Messiah, was an inconsistency on his part which redounds to his honor. Inasmuch as the power of the rabbins did not depend upon the political or hierarchical forms of the old commonwealth, it survived the fall of the latter. Out of what hitherto had been a purely moral influence something of an official position now grew. They formed themselves into a college which regarded itself as a continuation of the old Sinedrium, and which carried forward its name. At first its seat was at Jamnia, but it soon removed to Galilee, and remained longest at Tiberias. The presidency was hereditary in the family of Hillel, with the last descendants of whom the court itself came to an end. 271 The respect in which the synedrial president was held rapidly increased. Like Christian patriarchs under Mahometan rule, he was also recognized by the imperial government as the municipal head of the Jews of Palestine, and bore the secular title of the old high priests, Nasi, Ethnarch, Patriarch. Under him the Palestinian Jews continued to form a kind of state within a state until the 5th century. From the non-Palestinian Jews he received offerings of money. Compare Gothafridus on Codex Theod, 16. 8. The Judaize, and Marinus, Exer. Bibble. 2. Exerc. 3. 4. The task of the rabbins was so to reorganize Judaism under the new circumstances that it could continue to assert its distinctive character. What of external consistency had been lost through the extinction of the ancient commonwealth required to be compensated for by an inner centralization proportionately stronger. The separation from everything heathenish became more pronounced than before, the use of the Greek language was of necessity still permitted, but at least the Septuagint was set aside by Aquila, Cod. Justinian, November. 146, inasmuch as it had now become the Christian Bible. For to this period also belongs the definitive separation between the synagogue and the church, henceforward Christianity could no longer figure as a Jewish sect. Intensified exclusiveness was accompanied by increased internal stringency. What at an earlier period had still remained to some extent fluid now became rigidly fixed. For example, an authentic text of the canon was now established, and at the same time the distinction between canon and apocrypha sharply drawn. The old tendency of the scribes to leave as little as possible free to the individual conscience, but to bring everything within the scope of positive ordinance, now celebrated its greatest triumphs. It was only an apparent movement in the direction of liberty, if regulations which had become quite impossible were now modified or cancelled. 
the most influential of the rabbins were indeed the least solicitous about the maintenance of what was old, and had no hesitation in introducing numerous and thoroughgoing innovations, but the conservatives are Eliezer ben Hyrcanus and R. Ishmael ben Elisha were in truth more liberal-minded than the leaders of the Party of Progress, notably than R. Akiba. Even the Ultramontanes have never hesitated at departures from the usage of the ancient and medieval church. And the Pharisaic rabbins were guided in their innovations by liberal principles no more than they. The object of the new determinations was simply to widen the domain of the law in a consistent manner, to bring the individual entirely under the iron rule of system. But the Jewish communities gave willing obedience to the hierarchy of the rabbins. Judaism had to be maintained, cost what it might. That the means employed were well adapted to the purpose of maintaining the Jews as a firmly compacted religious community even after all bonds of nationality had fallen away cannot be doubted. But whether the attainment of this purpose by incredible exertion was a real blessing to themselves and the world may very well be disputed. One consequence of the process of intellectual isolation and of the effort to shape everything in accordance with hard and fast rules and doctrines was the systematization and codification of juristic and ritual tradition. A work with which a beginning was made in the century following the destruction of Jerusalem. Towards the end of the second century the Pharisaic doctrine of Hillel as it had been further matured by Akiba was codified and elevated to the position of statute law by the patriarch Rabban Judah the Holy, Mishnah. 272 But this was only the first stage in the process of systematizing and fixing tradition. The Mishnah became itself the object of rabbinical comment and supplement. The Tanaim, whose work was registered in the Mathnitha, Mishnah, Delta Epsilon Upsilon Taro Omega Sigma Iota equals doctrine, were followed by the Amoraim, whose work in turn took permanent shape in the Gemara, equals doctrine. The Palestinian Gemara was reduced to writing in perhaps the 4th or 5th century. Unfortunately it has been preserved to us only in part, but appears to have reached the Middle Ages in a perfect state, compare Schiller Sinusy in the Academy, 1878, page 170 Seek. Even thus the process which issued in the production of the Talmud was not yet completed, the Babylonian Amoraim carried it forward for some time longer, until at last at the rise of Islam the Babylonian Gemara was also written down. In the 5th century Palestine ceased to be the center of Judaism. Several circumstances conspired to bring this about. The position of the Jews in the Roman Empire had changed for the worse with the elevation of Christianity to be the religion of the state, the large autonomy which until then they had enjoyed in Palestine was now restricted. Above all, the family of the patriarchs, which had come to form a veritable dynasty, became extinct. 273 But this did not make an end of what may be called the Jewish church state, henceforward it had its home in Babylonia. From the period of the exile, a numerous and coherent body of Jews had continued to subsist there, the Parthians and Sassanidae granted them self-government, at their head was a native prince, Resh Galutha, can be clearly traced from 2nd century AD. Onwards, who, when the Palestinian Patriarchate came to an end, was left without a rival. This remarkable relic of a Jewish commonwealth continued to exist until the time of the Abbasides. 274 even as early as the beginning of the 3rd century AD. Certain rabbins, at their head Abba Erika, Rab, had migrated from Palestine and founded a settlement for learning in the law in Babylonia. The schools there, at Pumbedatha, Sora, Nahardia, prospered greatly, vied with those of Palestine, and continued to exist after the cessation of the latter when the Patriarchate became extinct. Thus they had the last word in the settlement of doctrine. Alongside of the settlement of tradition went another task, that of fixing the letters of the consonantal text of the Bible, by the Masora, its vowel pronunciation, by the punctuation, and its translation into the Aramaic vernacular, Targum. Here also the Babylonians came after the Palestinians, yet of this sort of erudition Palestine continued to be the headquarters even after the 5th century. With this task, that of attaining to the greatest possible conformity to the letter and of continuing therein, the inner development of Jewish thought came to an end. 275 The later Hebrew literature, which does not fall to be considered here, contributed very few new elements. In so far as an intellectual life existed at all among the Jews of the Middle Ages, 
it was not a growth of native soil but proceeded from the Mahometan or Latin culture of individuals. The Kabbalah at most, and even it hardly with justice, can be regarded as having been a genuine product of Judaism. It originated in Palestine, and subsequently flourished chiefly in the later Middle Ages in Spain, and, like all other methodized nonsense, had strong attractions for Christian scholars. 16. The Jewish Dispersion Something still remains to be said with reference to the Diaspora. We have seen how it began, in spite of Josephus, and, 11. 5. 2. It is to be carried back not to the Assyrian but merely to the Babylonian captivity. It was not composed of Israelites, but solely of citizens of the southern kingdom. It received its greatest impulse from Alexander, and then afterwards from Caesar. In the Greco-Roman period Jerusalem at the time of the Great Festival presented the appearance of a veritable Babel, Acts 2. 9-11, with the Jews themselves were mingled the proselytes, Acts 2. 11, for even already that religion was gaining considerable conquests among the heathen, as King Agrippa I, writes to the Emperor Caius, Philo, Legat. Ad Gaim, Section. 36, Jerusalem is the metropolis not only of Judea but of very many lands, on account of the colonies which on various occasions, Pi Kappa Alpha Iodoro Nu, it has sent out into the adjoining countries of Egypt, Phoenicia, Syria, and Coela Syria. And into the more remote Pamphylia, Cilicia, the greater part of Asia Minor as far as to Bithynia and the remotest parts of Pontus. Likewise into Europe, Thessaly, Boeotia, Macedonia, Aetolia, Attica, Argos, Corinth, most parts, and these the fairest, of the Peloponnesus. Nor are the Jewish settlements confined to the mainland only. They are found also in the more important islands, Euboea, Cyprus, Crete. I do not insist on the countries beyond the Euphrates, for with few exceptions all of them, Babylon and the fertile regions around it, have Jewish inhabitants. In the west of Europe also they were not wanting, many thousands of them lived in Rome. In those cities where they were at all numerous they, during the imperial period, formed separate communities. Josephus has preserved a great variety of documents in which the Roman authorities recognized their rights and liberties, especially as regards the Sabbath rest and the observance of festivals. Of greatest importance was the community in Alexandria. According to Philo a million of Jews had their residence there under an ethnarch for whom a Jerusha was afterward substituted by Augustus, in Flak, Sex. 6. 10. The extent to which this diaspora was helpful in the diffusion of Christianity, the manner in which the mission of the apostles everywhere attached itself to the synagogues and prosukai, is well known from the New Testament. That the Christians of the first century had much to suffer along with the Jews is also a familiar fact. For at this period, in other respects more favorable to them than any other had previously been, the Jews had occasionally to endure persecution. The emperors, taking umbrage at their intrusiveness, more than once banished them from Rome, Acts 18. 2. The goodwill of the native population they never secured, they were most hated in Egypt and Syria, where they were strongest. 276. The position of the Jews in the Roman Empire was naturally not improved by the great risings under Nero, Trajan, in Cyrene, Cyprus, Mesopotamia, and Hadrian. The East strictly so called, became more and more their proper home. The Christianization of the Empire helped still further in a very special way to detach them from the Western world. 277 They sided with the Persians against the Byzantines. In the year 614 they were even put in possession of Jerusalem by Khosros, but were not long able to hold their own against Heraclius. 278 With Islam also they found themselves in greater sympathy than with Christianity, although they were cruelly treated by Muhammad in Arabia, and driven by Omar out of the Hejaz. And notwithstanding the facts that they were as matter of course excluded from citizenship, and that they were held by Muslims as a whole in greater contempt than the Christians. They throve especially well on what may be called the bridge between East and West, in Mauritania and Spain, where they were the intellectual intermediaries between the Arab and the Latin culture. In the Sephardim and Ashkenazim the distinction between the subtler Oriental and the more conservative Western Jews has maintained itself in Europe also.
From the 8th century onwards Judaism put forth a remarkable side shoot in the Khazars on the Volga, if legend is to he believed, but little was required at one time to have induced the Russians to accept the Jewish rather than the Christian faith. In the West the equal civil rights which Caracalla had conferred on all free inhabitants of the empire came to an end, so far as the Jews were concerned, in the time of Constantine. The state then became the secular arm of the church, and took action, though with less severity, against Jews just as against heretics and pagans. As early as the year 315, Constantine made conversion from Christianity to Judaism a penal offense, and prohibited Jews, on pain of death, from circumcising their Christian slaves. These laws were re-enacted and made more severe by Constantius, who attached the penalty of death to marriages between Jews and Christians. Theodosius I. And Honorius, indeed, by strictly prohibiting the destruction of synagogues, and by maintaining the old regulation that a Jew was not to be summoned before a court of justice on a Sabbath day, put a check upon the militant zeal of the church. By which even Chrysostom, for example, allowed himself to be carried away at Antioch. But Honorius rendered them ineligible for civil or military service, leaving open to them only the bar and the decurionate, the latter being a privilegium odiosum. Their liberty to try cases by their own law was curtailed. The cases between Jews and Christians were to be tried by Christian judges only. Theodosius II prohibited them from building new synagogues, and anew enforced their disability for all state employments. Most hostile of all was the Orthodox Justinian, who, however, was still more severe against pagans and Samaritans. 279 He harassed the Jews with a law enjoining them to observe Easter on the same day as the Christians, a law which it was of course found impossible to carry out. 280 in the Germanic states which arose upon the ruins of the Roman Empire, the Jews did not fare badly on the whole. It was only in cases where the state was dominated by the Catholic Church, as, for example, among the Spanish Visigoths, that they were cruelly oppressed, among the Aryan Ostrogoths, on the other hand, they had nothing to complain of. One thing in their favor was the Germanic principle that the law to be applied depended not on the land but on the nationality, as now in the East Europeans are judged by the consuls according to the law of their respective nations. The autonomy of the Jewish communities, which had been curtailed by the later emperors, was now enlarged once more under the laxer political and legal conditions. The Jews fared remarkably well under the Frankish monarchy. The Carolingians helped them in every possible way, making no account of the complaints of the bishops. They were allowed to hold property in land, but showed no eagerness for it. Leaving agriculture to the Germans, they devoted themselves to trade. The market was completely in their hands, as a specially lucrative branch of commerce they still carried on the traffic in slaves, which had engaged them even in ancient times. 281. Meanwhile the church was not remiss in seeking constantly repeated reenactments of the old imperial laws, in the framing of which she had had paramount influence, and which she now incorporated with her own canon law. 282 Gradually she succeeded in attaining her object. In the later Middle Ages the position of the Jews in the Christian society deteriorated. Intercourse with them was shunned, their isolation from being voluntary became compulsory. From the 13th century onwards they were obliged to wear, as a distinctive mark, more necessary in the East than in the West, a round or square yellow badge on their breast. 283 The difference of religion elicited a well-marked religious hate with oft-repeated deadly outbreaks, especially during the period of the Crusades, and afterwards when the Black Death was raging, 1348-50. Practical consequences like these the Church of course did not countenance, the Pope set themselves against persecutions of the Jews, 284, but with imperfect success. The popular aversion rested by no means exclusively on religious considerations. Worldly motives were also present. The Jews of that period had in a still higher degree than now the control of financial affairs in their hands, and they used it without scruple. The Church herself had unintentionally given them a monopoly of the money market, by forbidding Christians to take interest. 285 In this way the Jews became rich indeed, 
but at the same time made themselves still more repugnant to the Christian population than they previously were by reason of their religion. Having, according to the later medieval system, no rights in the Christian state, the Jews were tolerated only in those territories where the sovereign in the exercise of free favor accorded them protection. This protection was granted them in many quarters, but never for nothing, numerous and various taxes, which could be raised or changed in a perfectly arbitrary way, were exacted in exchange. But in countries where the feeling of nationality attained to a vigorous development, the spirit of toleration was speedily exhausted, the Jews were expelled by the act of the state. England was the first kingdom in which this occurred, 1290. France followed in 1395, Spain and Portugal in 1492 and 1495. In this way it came about that the Holy Roman Empire, Germany, Italy, and adjoining districts, became the chief abode of the Jews. 286 In the anarchy which here prevailed they could best maintain their separate attitude, and if they were expelled from one locality they readily found refuge in some other. The emperor had indeed the right of extirpating them altogether, with the exception of a small number to be left as a memorial. But, in the first place, he had in various ways given up this right to the states of the empire, and, moreover, his pecuniary resources were so small that he could not afford to want the tax which the Jews as his Servi Camry paid him for protecting their persons and property. In spite of many savage persecutions the Jews maintained their ground, especially in those parts of Germany where the political confusion was greatest. They even succeeded in maintaining a kind of autonomy by means of an arrangement in virtue of which civil processes which they had against each other were decided by their own rabbins in accordance with the law of the Talmud. 287. The Jews, through their having on the one hand separated themselves, and on the other hand been excluded on religious grounds from the Gentiles, gained an internal solidarity and solidity which has hitherto enabled them to survive all the attacks of time. The hostility of the Middle Ages involved them in no danger, the greatest peril has been brought upon them by modern times, along with permission and increasing inducements to abandon their separate position. It is worthwhile to recall on this point the opinion of Spinoza, who was well able to form a competent judgment, tract. Theol, Politics, c. 4, Ad Fin. That the Jews have maintained themselves so long in spite of their dispersed and disorganized condition is not at all to be wondered at. When it is considered how they separated themselves from all other nationalities in such a way as to bring upon themselves the hatred of all, and that not only by external rights contrary to those of other nations, but also by the sign of circumcision, which they maintain most religiously. Experience shows that their conservation is due in a great degree to the very hatred which they have incurred. When the king of Spain compelled the Jews either to accept the national religion or to go into banishment, very many of them accepted the Roman Catholic faith, and in virtue of this received all the privileges of Spanish subjects, and were declared eligible for every honor. The consequence was that a process of absorption began immediately, and in a short time neither trace nor memory of them survived. Quite different was the history of those whom the king of Portugal compelled to accept the creed of his nation. Although converted, they continued to live apart from the rest of their fellow subjects, having been declared unfit for any dignity. So great importance do I attach to the sign of circumcision also in this connection, that I am persuaded that it is sufficient by itself to maintain the separate existence of the nation forever. The persistency of the race may of course prove a harder thing to overcome than Spinoza has supposed. But nevertheless he will be found to have spoken truly in declaring that the so-called emancipation of the Jews must inevitably lead to the extinction of Judaism wherever the process is extended beyond the political to the social sphere. For the accomplishment of this centuries may be required. The End